Republican Governor Tim Pawlenty signed the Next Generation Act into law in 2007, and Minnesota has fallen behind in reaching those goals. Senator Nick Frentz is carrying legislation that would get the state back on track, and I spoke with him this week. It was three months before the COVID-19 pandemic began that you and I last sat down and talked about climate change and clean energy and moving the state in that direction. In, in that time, has anything in the picture really changed? Did the pandemic just put a pause on this conversation? Well, first of all, Shannon, thank you for having me again. These are great topics and I'm glad to join you. To your question, there's two answers. One is, yes, things have changed. The nation and the world have gotten new information. It's important information and the ground is shifting on climate change and energy conservation. The second answer is in the Minnesota legislature, we're still divided and so far not much has changed about the laws that we've passed. To your first part, we have new information about how climate change is affecting our country. In an example, we had 94 billion of insurance claims that Munich Re, a national reinsurer, attributes to storm damage that we wouldn't have had but for the changes of climate change, 94 billion. The year before, 46. So we're watching some fairly significant impacts, fires, rain events, and some of the warming of the ocean things that happened in the Southeast United States. And of course that's happening across the globe. So we're seeing that change. We're also seeing, in my opinion, some change in public opinion. As you know, 25 years ago, we had debates about climate change. Was it serious? Was it man-made? Could we do anything about it? And I would suggest to you and your viewers that that has changed and that it's more clear than ever that it is real and that we can do something and we should. And to the second part, uh, we have not seen dramatic legislation passed yet here in the Minnesota legislature, but that's why we have shows like Capitol Report so we can discuss those things. Okay, and to that point, you're carrying the governor's bill uh, in the Senate, and it's a bill that includes the goal of 100% clean energy in the state's electricity sector by 2040. Is this a reachable goal? Well, I'm getting the impression it's not very reachable in the Minnesota Senate this year as we have not been given a hearing for the bill. And I have asked the chair of the committee, could we have a hearing and could we include in that hearing some testimony about climate change and some of the things you and I have already talked about. I do think it's a realistic target and it includes some features that Minnesotans should be aware of. First of all, we've had improvements in the carbon emissions in our electric generation sector. That's good news down about 30% from its peak so that we've made improvements in the way we put out wind, solar, nuclear, coal, natural gas. Those are all good things. Can we reach 100% by 2040? I think we can. But a feature of the bill that people, including those members of the Commission of the Public Utilities Commission, have noted is that it has an off-ramp. So two of the most important features of energy generation are price, and reliability. And the off-ramp is a portion of the bill that says to the PUC, Public Utilities Commission, hey, if we're at 2035 and there's just no way to do this, you do not have to approve a resource plan that um, asks the impossible. So I think the bill makes good sense for us. And I think the next 20 years, frankly, is fairly serious times for Minnesota, the country, and the world. world. Last night, I spent some time on the Minnesota Department of Commerce website uh, looking at the energy data dashboard. In 2019, 26% of Minnesota's electricity generation came from renewable sources. And of that, 19% was wind. Uh, the other components were solo, biomass, and hydro. Is the idea to continue to increase these particular uh, types of renewable energy? Well, this is really the central question and thank you, Shannon. This is really what we should be talking about in Minnesota. The answer to your question is, we don't have a specific mix right now today that we say is perfect for 2040. And if anyone comes on your show and says they do have it, please give them my phone number. I would love to hear from them. What we do wanna do is set the goal. And as you mentioned, wind in particular, unsubsidized wind is cheap and it has some major advantages. So are we headed that direction? Sure looks that way to me, but what we wanna do is set the goal and then turn loose innovation, uh, American ingenuity, entrepreneurship to see exactly what technologies are standing in 2040. For example, we have uh, biofuels, the use of ethanol and biodiesel. Um, some of us think that we should give that a hell of a look. 
as we talk about our energy mix. Some of us think wind and solar are simply going to continue to outstrip everything else in terms of cost, but they have reliability questions. They're fantastic in many ways, but the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. So to your question, if you ask me, yeah, I think we'll continue to see increase in wind and solar, but you mentioned hydro, uh, you mentioned the other forms of energy generation, and I think they deserve a chance to say that they'll be here as part of our permanent mix 20 years from now. And you can find a lot of people who will tell you this technology can't possibly compete 20 years from now. This one is definitely going to be there. I'm not smart enough to know those things for sure. But I think if we set a goal, you'll see, again, innovation and entrepreneurship and state policy come together and you'll find out who the winners are and Minnesota will be better off for it. Does money need to be invested in encouraging that kind of work? Yeah, I think we do. And I think we, we find state government investing money where we have a collective interest as Minnesotans. When one community or one individual citizen can't do it, but together, it's a good thing. A couple basic examples would be transportation, public education. So the state has a reason to put money into it. And we do, and I think we're pretty good at it, especially in education. Same thing for our energy policy. We have the ability, for example, to incentivize electric vehicle charging stations to help with transmission costs. We generate energy, but you have to then transmit that energy to where the users are. Um, those of us that represent Southern Minnesota are really proud of some of the wind and solar arrays that have been built in Southern Minnesota, but you have to get that energy up to where most of the users are, which is the Metro. And that takes investment by the state in transmission and often in partnership with some of the utilities, both investor owned utilities like Excel and then municipal co-op utilities like uh, I'm a customer of Benco in North Mankato. So yes, we do wanna put state resources into that. And I think that partnership's likely to continue to be fruitful. More than 20% of the state's electricity is generated through nuclear power. And some people argue that nuclear has to remain a part of the equation of, of getting away from fossil fuels. Uh, those licenses on those, on those two facilities expire in the next decade. What is the role of nu nuclear power in the future? Well, first of all, I've got the impression that one of those uh, leases is going to ask for a 10-year extension here fairly soon to the Public Utilities Commission. So we're going to get an answer. And I think the commission's hearings with testimony and evidence and people smarter than me will tell the commission what they should do. I think it's a legitimate question and I'm not positive. And here's the reason. If our goal is carbon reduction, if that's our number one thing, and I think it is, I mean, that's what's warming the planet and that's causing some real problems. Nuclear is a carbon-free source. There's not really any denying that it's carbon-free. There are those, and I respect them, who say the nuclear waste issue is a very serious one. And they point out that waste is radioactive for hundreds of thousands of years, potentially. So that's pretty serious too, especially if you want to have grandkids. I hope my kids are listening. They're all in their 20s. Let's go, kids. And so I think the open question on nuclear is that we do not lift the moratorium now. I voted against that recently, but I think it has to remain part of the discussion at least till 2035. Again, we're not positive what the technology and innovation is going to be. One last point on nuclear for those of us that are kind of watching is that it is not proving to be competitive on cost lately. There's very little nuclear being built around the country. And as you know, some states have different rules about nuclear. And one of the biggest new plan efforts essentially uh, crumbled um, figuratively because of the cost. And so wind and solar's current price competitiveness um, in particular have caused a lot of states to say, you know, whatever you think of nuclear waste, I don't know if we can afford nuclear power. Stay tuned on nuclear. And finally, one last thing about coal. Uh, the state's reliance on coal for electricity generation has been declining. In 2019, it was down to just 31 percent. Is the idea eventually, sooner rather than later, zero coal generated electricity? Well, I'd say that's the trend, but I would not say we have to answer that question definitively today. I think for the same reasons that we've been talking about these other forms of energy succeeding, um, wind, solar, uh, for the same reason that we talk about carbon emissions being a priority where nuclear uh, gets a bit of a nod, coal has not yet made it clear how they're going to compete if we have this 20 to 25 year time frame. Um, 
I don't know exactly where Cole's future is, but I don't see any bright future for them if they're going to have to compete in the basic fields of price, reliability, and carbon emission reduction. And if they do, God bless them, because again, we have innovation, we have technology, we have entrepreneurship, and I think we got to turn loose those forces and see what we can do. But we have to commit, Shannon, to a carbon emission reduction and fairly major reductions too. Senator Nick Franz, always a pleasure. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks for having me. Have a great week.